Alright, what is going on, lovely people of the world? It's that time again. It's time for some Nate Talks. Now, some of these I have already actually talked about uh, in the videos for their respective games, so I'm not going to get too in-depth with it. But basically, before I started, I wanted to throw a table of contents out at you guys, so if you're not interested in, you know, anime games, you can skip to whatever topic may light up your interest. And so I'll just put, like, timestamps. I don't know if I'm going to get fancy enough and use annotations and shit, or if I'm just going to stick them in the description box, but I will leave timestamps there for when it, each thing happens. And so you can just skip to them if you want to uh, look at them. So, table of contents, what I'm going to talk about. The Undernight and Birth update. Uh, Guilty Gear, obviously new characters have been announced. Well, new character, because I have talked about Johnny a little bit. A little bit about Pokemon, not much, but I just want to, I kind of want to rant a little bit on Hidden Machines. Dark Souls 2, a couple more experiences in that. Basically, everything fr everything after the Pokemon thing is going to be from software related. Uh, Dark Souls 3 was recently announced. We're going to talk about that plenty. Bloodborne, uh, it's obviously, you know, there's DLC announced. And there's also an experience I want to speak of that I recently had with that. And so I'll put in each individual game what I talk about so you can skip directly to that if you care about that. But again, everything after the Pokemon talk is going to be from software related. So firstly... The Undernight and Birth update. I cannot believe I completely forgot to uh, talk about that in the previous video since I talked about the Guilty Gear update and the Blaze Blue update. And instead, I, I my f new favorite fighting game I completely forgot to talk about. Very happy that there's going to be an update. I have no idea when it's going to end up coming to consoles. And obviously, you know, potential importation is a deal because it's just a simple fact of life. Like, everything kind of... You never really know when it's going to come out. For instance, Blaze Blue Extend did not have a huge gap in time. Like, I think it's announced for the end of June for coming out in the United States. And it only came out like a month ago in Japan. Versus the original Chrono Phantasma had about a six month gap in between Japanese release and United States release. And uh, poor Europe in that whole entire factor. They still have to wait three years. They're probably just getting Calamity Trigger right now. Isn't that fun? But so anyway, like I said, I'm very excited for it. Uh, Nanase has been buffed a bit. Gordo has been nerfed a bit. You know, there's nerfs, there's buffs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they're just low tests right now, as far as I'm aware. So obviously none of those changes are set in stone. Nothing's permanent. But it'll be, it'll just be nice. It's a simple fact. The anime game community uh, hops over to the whatever the newest release of a game is. And that's when, that's when the population is popping. And so it'll be nice to hop in there and have an active community to participate in regardless of how long it lasts just you know enjoy it while it lasts pure and simple and i intend to do that so we'll see how it goes guilty gear miss jacko can we talk about how uninspired that name is her name is jacko because she has a jack-o-lantern shackled to her leg i'm letting the silence go on because that's how awkward it is how fucking silly is that? That kind of bugs me a little bit. Uh, she does look interesting, I have to admit. However, I think, like, just looking at her aesthetically, it's just kind of like, is this is this new? Like, just the white hair, the kind of overall facial look that she has. Um, obviously, there's really nothing similar in gameplay. I haven't se I've seen very little in regards to her gameplay, and obviously nobody has even gotten close to being able to show off her actual potential within the game. So, you know, you can't really talk about whether or not you think this is a good addition, a bad addition, blah, blah, blah. But I am interested. I do think that from what I have seen from her as a character, I will totally check her out. We'll end up, I mean, obviously we'll end up seeing. Um, I need to, the first thing I need to fucking do is actually learn Sin, which is something I've been intending to do for a while now. So I need to actually learn the game before I can really start uh, considering learning a character. But I do think she looks interesting. And I am happy that it's not, like, an uninspired edition. For instance, like, maybe, I don't know, somebody named Celica or splitting up New into New and Lambda, where everybody's going to play New and nobody's going to play Lambda. Blaze Blue. Stupid fucking extend. So, yeah, I am glad. I'm happy. And I kind of, I'm okay with what it, how it seems to be they're going to release, like, one old person and one new person with each you know subsequent character release i'm okay with that i understand that obviously you want to grow the franchise and you want to provide new things while also providing something uh for nostalgia's sake for the old fans and i think johnny was 
the most demanded character so far. And obviously, he's also in the story mode of this game. I don't know anything about the story, but I remember glancing up and seeing him there while I was skipping through the entire thing just so I could complete it for the points so I can unlock Sin. <laughs> but I know he was there, and I think there's some other characters that are there that people are still eagerly anticipating. So, you know, we'll see how what characters get released. Obviously, I've mentioned it before. I'm looking forward to Testament and Zappa. We'll see if they ever get in. And obviously, I can hope for it. But in the meantime, I just want interesting characters. I want characters that I can look at and say, I want to play that character. I am interested in them, and I think I want to try them out. And Jacko fits that bill. So we'll see how that goes. But I am eagerly anticipating what they come up with. Uh, they seem to be making it more dramatic. Like, Giuna posted a video of basically, like, slowdown where it was possible that, you know, like, both players had very low health. They bro they both threw out a hit. And so it kind of went into, like, bullet time. Like, oh, who's going to win? Whoever hits this is going to win. And then it finishes it off. I like that kind of... I, I kind of... Part of me likes that drama, but part of me is like, that's a little over the top unnecessary and we will probably get old very quickly. Kind of like fatalities in Mortal Kombat where you have those you know the first moment it happens you're like oh my god that was amazing and then the second time it happens like ah oh, okay yeah that still looks kind of cool and the third time it happens can we just can we just move on let me just hit rematch real quick fuck your fatality I don't even care <laughs> so hopefully it isn't something that just ends up getting old really quickly but it also depends because obviously every single match of Mortal Kombat you have the potential to see a fatality versus if that's just something that happens once in a blue moon that'll be a cool kind of a thing Obviously, you know, the amount of exposure something gets matters to how quickly it grows old. Um, but yeah, they're making some system changes. I hear they're completely getting rid of danger time. Um, so, you know, we'll see what they do with the game. But I am, I'm looking forward to it. Again, it's the same exact kind of a deal. You know, they haven't, from what I have seen, they have not doled it down and made it a boring shell of its original self. Like any games with extend in the fucking title. So bitter about that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm eagerly looking forward to anything that I can pick up, play, and enjoy. And I think Guilty Gear is shaping up to be that kind of a thing right now. So, let me get a sip of water first. Pokemon. Let me just brag for a little bit here. This is actually the first time this has happened to me. This is, I have never managed to catch a legendary Pokemon in one single throw before, aside from the obvious Master Ball usage. I caught Rayquaza in a single Ultra Ball, and I was very excited about that. It made me very happy, and so I just noted that down. I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. It's the first time this happened to me. I've played every single Pokemon release ever, and I have never caught a Legendary that quickly, so that made me happy. And I like stuff that makes me happy. Um, but so what I actually wanted to talk about is my utter disbelief that hidden machines are still in Pokemon games in their original incarnations. How, for those of you that may not play Pokemon, but you're still listening, hidden machines are these things, are specific moves that you can teach to certain Pokemon in the game, and they have overworld implications. They are stuff like cut, so, you know, they may place trees in your way that you have to bypass to access later levels in the game, and so that's basically, you know, blocking that off from you, so it's basically saying you have to achieve this, the ability to use this to further progress same thing with something like strength they'll put boulders in your way and you need strength to move them and so it's perfectly fine that they have those kind of exploration barricades there to ensure that you're not going somewhere you don't really belong too early that being said the fact that they still number one require being taught to a pokemon rather than just being like you have a pokemon in your party strong enough to move this or with sharp enough claws to cut this or as a water Pokemon so they can surf and travel on the seas instead of you know requiring it to be a learned move that part is ridiculous to me just that part alone however on top of that the fact that they have retained see like that part would not be that bad in and of itself if you could also forget them at any point in time you can't if you teach the move to a Pokemon, the only possible way to get rid of a hidden machine is to go to a specific NPC in the game specified as what they t uh, call a move deleter, and you have to go all the way to them to unlearn that move, and there's no other way to remove that move from a Pokemon. And so this has resulted in what is basically termed as uh, 
HM whores, or is it HM sluts? I don't know which. I don't know which derogatory term it uses. But basically, that is used to describe a Pokemon that people utilize that can learn four of those HMs. So you just are wasting a Pokemon slot solely for somebody who can allow you to travel the world and actually allow you to explore appropriately. And it really sucks because they're not very good moves for fights. Like I consider Surf to be a pretty good in-fight move. But none of the other ones are even moderately worthwhile to bother uh, actually teaching to somebody that you want to actively use. And that really, really, I just don't understand because they're making so many other things so much more accessible, so much more convenient for the player. For something that I do think, you know, you kind of have to, you have to waste a slot or two on Pokemon that you don't particularly like but that are just capable of allowing you to explore the game. And otherwise, you know, without them, then you're just constantly stuck exploring only half of areas because the other half is hidden behind something that requires strength or cut or surf or waterfall or a uh, dive or, you know, whatever, any of the amount of moves that are available. And that is ridiculous to me that it, that has lasted that long when they have made such strides to streamline the rest of the process. So uh, that makes me sad. I just wanted to kind of talk about that for a little bit because it really... I think that's something that should be changed just for the overall betterment of the series. So, obviously, since Pokemon pays all of the attention to my uh, Nate Talk series, I expect that to be fixed in the next version of the... What are they going to do, actually, with the title of the next version of the game? Because now that they've stopped using, you know, either colors or, you know, stuff that kind of colors, you know, Diamond and Pearl are obviously not really colors, but they're still kind of evoke a sort of, you know color idea you know you have pearl white i don't actually know if there's anything diamond but still blood diamond that's that's qualified as a color right not an implication of a terribly uh mine diamond <laughs> moving along but yeah so they have you know the last uh new edition that wasn't a remake of a previous game was obviously x and y so i'm kind of curious what they're gonna do with the next version a little also a little sad that people's uh, predictions of a Pokemon Z did not pan out. I mean, I don't know why. It's just that would have been hilariously amusing to me. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. So anyway, moving on to From Software stuff. A little bit more on Dark Souls. It's just it's the kind of the same thing as a Dark Souls rant. Just the first part of it is a uh, is a commentary on myself and how little I pay attention. So uh, you have a healing item in that game in Dark Souls 2 called the Estus Flask. And you can power this up through various things. You can find these things called Estus Flask Shards throughout the world. And uh, in doing those, you can turn them in. And that each Estus Flask Shard you turn in a lot gives you one extra sip of the Estus Flask. So it basically gives you one more heal. And there are also these items called Sublime Bone Dusts throughout the world. Which, if you bring them back to the main bonfire, you can then burn them. And that uh, powers up the Estus Flask. So it heals for more. Each time you sip, you get more health back. I wasn't paying attention and I had gotten myself I had gathered four sublime bone dusts before I ever thought like wait a minute I finally got the fourth one I was like I've gotten a few of these aren't these important I've been walking around with goddamn three sublime bone dusts before it occurred to me that maybe I should look into the functionality of these items shout outs to me um, but anyway, so this is also kind of just a commentary on the, the kind of the overall design flaw of Dark Souls 2, how this kind of works out. N not the uh, Dark Souls or any of the other, kind of any game that has boss battles in general is innocent of, but just absolutely nonsense deaths that just should not really exist in the game, but they just do. Uh, the Old Iron King. I'm going to set the stage for this. The Old Iron... You have to fight the Old Iron King on this kind of fairly small platform he's this giant demonic looking dude uh who rises up out of a gigantic pool of lava lake of lava really it's too big to be considered a pool and he just emerges out of that right so in front of you you're on this platform and in front of you is just this massive pool of lava which prevents uh for, you know like going out too far so basically the entire point of the fight is that you cannot get close enough to him to attack and you have to hit his limbs which, it just occurred to me, is the exact same thing as Ceaseless Discharge. Originality is a wonderful thing. So, <laughs> so, but anyway, moving on from that. Now, 
that by itself is fine. That's perfectly fine. However, there is one tiny little strip at like the back middle of the level that is an open pit of lava, which if you fall into, obviously you die. You cannot hop into lava and survive. And so it, that basically that is only there to screw the player. That is not there for any kind of, you know, like interesting functionality. It's not there to really like uh heighten the difficulty of the battle. It's literally only there to kind of just be like, "Hey, ah, ha, ha, sucks to be you. That you were so unlucky to be like staggered into that or like your dodge took you one pixel too far and you slipped off the edge or some shit. Like there's no point in it being there other than to provide cheap deaths." And that's what actually happened to me the first time I went into this fight. It's not a difficult fight, not at all. Like, I don't think anybody in the world would argue that the old Iron King is a difficult fight. Because all of his attacks are incredibly telegraphed, um, very easy to dodge. And he, it's not like, you know, there's a lot of time between each of his attacks. So it's not like, oh, he can suddenly just catch you out of nowhere with this swing that you need to be on the ball to manage to dodge like everything is very telegraphed you have about five seconds to react to all of his attacks they're not difficult to handle um but so anyway there was this one attack where a lot of bosses in the games like that do these you know bigger bosses that do these massive swinging attacks kind of have this phantom range to them where like the attack itself won't actually hit you but some sort of like shock wave or just kind of general aura of something will kind of catch you and do like a tiny amount of health but the main point of it is that it staggers you and that's basically to prevent people from being able to just like stand a pixel outside of the attack range and immediately go on the offensive the moment the limb is landed um but so this particular occasion i had him down he was one attack from dead just one single attack away from dead and he does this really wide sweeping slam on the ground and so uh he did two of them so I dodged the first one, but I was at some kind of a precarious position and I had to make sure that I was, you know, not dodging into my doom, basically. So I had to be a little bit careful about it, and so I missed the dodge by the barest inch. I did not actually get hit by it, but again, I got the reason why I talked about that whole phantom range thing is that I got clipped by that little bit of a, a phantom range. It staggered me in the backward stagger caused me to slip into that tiny pit that is there for no other reason than to provide you a cheap death and i hate shit like that like dying to something like that is just one of the worst experiences you can have in a game and dark souls 2 is so full of them that it's infuriating and it really shows like how little thought is really put into like making an interesting cohesive wonderful world and it's rather just filled with moments of like cheapness where sure the whole element of you can die at any time is there but not through any fault of your own it's not a skill based kind of a thing it's just there's shit around that you know you can be unlucky to be affected on it by like it's, it has nothing to really do with you has nothing to do with particular skill on your part it's just there and it can screw you at any point in time that's what happened to me and so i really just wanted to kind of talk about that and another similar thing let me get another drink Mimics. Mimics in this game. Now, I'm obviously not crying about Mimics being in the game. I like that. I like how it provides a certain sense of suspense when you're approaching chess. You know, is this a Mimic? Is it not? Is this dangerous? What's going to happen? I love that. I love that atmospheric uh, bit of danger that that applies to the world. However, I thought I was being a smart motherfucker. So, what they do, like, in Dark Souls 1, when you attacked a Mimic, it would get up. And it wouldn't attack, it would get itself upright into basically its neutral position before its AI would activate them and it would start attacking you. In Dark Souls 2, no matter what you do, whether or not you open it or you attack it first, it will always do, I don't know if it's the exact same animation, but I'm pretty sure it actually is, which occurs to me, more laziness on the part of From Software, if that is true. Um, it does this forward lunging attack. Which makes perfect sense if you're opening up the chest and it's like, oh, hey, this thing suddenly has teeth. Oh, I'm dead. Again, makes perfect sense under that circumstance. However, again, it's this forward lunging momentum attack. I thought I was being one smart motherfucker by being like, oh, shit. It has forward momentum. 
I'm gonna hit it from the back, ladies. But ser- but in all seriousness, um, it teleported me. Like I just it didn't. The attack did not hit me. The attack did not strike me. Not a single part of the mimic's body hit me. And yet it clearly has just the, um, this mysterious, miraculous 360 degree hitbox to it. And it literally teleported my character from about a foot behind the mimic to directly in front of it. Which was about like a five foot distance, just out of nowhere. And it, again, it just goes to show how like, you're not really rewarded for intelligent shit in that game. How, like, I thought that was... I mean, not to try and, you know, float my own boat and act like I'm the most brilliant motherfucker on the planet, but that's such a basic idea, right? Like, oh, this thing is so dangerous from the front, let me hit it from the back. That kind of, you know, that, that kind of thought process, that kind of experimentation, I, that's something that in video games, you want to reward and encourage, and instead they bit sl- slap you upside the face and say, no, fight like a bitch. That's the only possible way you can succeed in this game. That's bullshit design, and it really irritates me. Like it really, it just really goes to show like how little regard that team of developers has for like the overall enjoyment of the game, and like it just kind of suggests that you know they they were in that creative process in order to fuck with the players more so than to create you know like a beautiful world, that kind of a thing, and that irritates me. So anyway, that is it for Dark Souls 2 Bloodborne. I'm going to kind of cut this down. I did have a lot more to talk about, but now that I uh, Dark Souls 3 got announced, I'm going to talk about it less. Basically, with Bloodborne, I recently decided to go back into it because there was a recent, but not a terribly recent patch, but the most recent patch for Bloodborne buffed the Beast Claw. And I was always interested in the Beast Claw. That was actually the very first weapon that I was like, yo... I want to get this and I want to use this. It's why I went into Chalice Dungeons in the first place. Those boring motherfuckers. So anyway, I mean, to basically summarize the whole experience, I tried to get to the Beast Claw as quickly as I possibly could. It only occurred to me afterward that I probably could have used a short ritual chalice in order to uh, do it as fast as possible rather than actually going through all the normal Chalice Dungeons. But it really just struck... (laughs) Oh, God, I was so mad at the entire thing. It was so... Chalice Dungeons just suck. They're terrible all around, and they just suck. But all of the best equipment in the game is barricaded behind them. Like, you have to participate in them if you want to actually be at an equal strength level to the people that do take the PvP of that game as seriously as possible and will spend hours and hours grinding for the best possible gems, which are like exponentially better than the best ones you can get through the main story there's no there's no argument there they're significantly better but anyway so i finally got to the beast claw and after so much time so much effort i died so many times in chalice dungeons because i was so massively under leveled for uh what they kind of expect you to be for that level of chalice dungeon and the hilarious thing is like i was under leveled the entire time for chalice dungeons but i came out massively over leveled for the main story like i chewed through the entire story right up until the final boss and the final main boss that we'll talk about the final secret boss afterward and fighting the final main boss actually really irritated me it really made me sad because it made me realize that like you can beat him without using parrying but it's so much it's so significantly less efficient uh so much more dangerous and honestly it's kind of unfair to try to fight him without parrying because like he can just randomly decide to break out of a stagger and just smack you across the face with a sword so, like, like I'm not trying to say like oh I should be able to permanently stagger this guy it's unfair that he should break out of that but the fact that he can break out of the stagger and immediately counter attack me for you know half my health or more that's a little irksome a little bit and it can happen at any time it's not like you can predict it like oh, okay I can get three safe swings right here and then after that he breaks out and bops me so after three strikes I need to back off and uh, reevaluate my position and try to find a safe spot to attack again it just it just happens randomly like you know you're rolling the dice every single time you hit the attack button and so just the fact that it's like this boss is so clearly designed to be fought with a gun and then visceral attack him rather than like actually making him interesting to fight for all the various weapon types and what you can do the trick styles all of that stuff 
And uh, then, so I thought th I thought that angered me because I basically I tried three times with the Beast Claw and never got him below uh, thirty percent health. Trying to just use the tricked version of it because I couldn't build any momentum to actually uh, build up Beasthood. So you know the obvious effect of the Beast Claw is just completely irrelevant here if I can't build up Beasthood. But on top of that, um, I also can't really hit him. Like, the entire point of the Beast Claw is this kind of the same thing as the Blade of Mercy. It's all momentum-based. You want to be chaining together attacks. It doesn't have, like... Well, it does have one giant fuck you with the Blade of Mercy. I believe it's the dashing attack. For the uh, Beast Claw, it's the L2 attack. And that's also the L2 attack is the one that builds the most Beasthood. But both of the, those attacks are very slow. Very easy for the final boss to counterattack you during, which is the last thing you want, because chances are you'll die. Um, so it's just, you know, it kind of, it made me sad that, that weapon was so useless in that fight. And then I went on and I was like, you know what, fuck it, let me just parry this guy. And I killed him in my first attempt without using a single blood vial. And just seeing that kind of disparity in design, how it wasn't like, obviously I have the skill necessary to do this, but it's so much exponentially more dangerous under these circumstances than this one it's kind of it i didn't like that very much and that kind of irritated me but again then i got to the final secret boss Ooh, uh i couldn't even hit it <laughs> like for those of you that have i don't want to spoil anything about it because obviously not everybody has a ps4 that wants one and obviously there are going to be plenty of people who want to play bloodborne so i don't want to spoil it but basically to just set the stage it has a very uh it's a it's large but it's also very thin at the same time. However, because of how large it is, it kind of has to keep you back far enough to account for how large it is so you can't just like walk into it. I could not hit it from the side. Literally, my attacks would just not connect if I tried to attack it from the side. I had to attack it from the back or from the front, which are the two most dangerous places to attack it from. And so I quit after that. Like I gave it one attempt and I just saw 75% of my attacks completely whiff and I was like fuck this it is so fucking dumb this stupid design ah so uh that made me very sad so hopefully to move right into the next topic they fix that they fix that in Dark Souls 3 um again I have not um really looked into specifically all of the various information surrounding Dark Souls 3 I know some information was leaked and I did uh, look into that. It seems like they have some very unique ideas for bonfires in Dark Souls 3. Like, apparently, um, the entire point of it are, like, there won't be static bonfire. Maybe there will be in addition to what they announced. But from what I heard, basically, what you have to do is, like, you basically spear a corpse. Whatever you want. And that builds a bonfire. But doing so also opens you up to invasion and potentially has other ramifications to it and like it seems like they're kind of bringing back a version of tendency which was in demon souls if you haven't played demon souls there was there were certain actions that you could do to either turn uh, a world into pure black tent towards black tendency or towards white tendency but it wasn't i mean in theory it was a it's a very good idea i like it and it caused you know various events to happen depending on what tendency the world is at various npcs or items would only show up if you were in a certain tendency and so i like the idea that you can affect the world in a tangible way that said there wasn't any real particular good way to actually take it like the only it was almost impossible to get a world to pure white tendency or even pure black tendency really like you had to actively attempt to do it which isn't a problem in and of itself but it was basically impossible to get to pure white tendency in a world without first taking the world to pure black tendency and so like getting it that far it basically it spawns uh, numerous things which up the tendency towards white and so basically the entire thing is like you want to die three times and that are like three or more times however many you have to to get the world to pure black tendency and then you kill these certain things like you kill this thing that spawns and immediately brings it up to a, I think plus two white tendency and then you can kill one boss and that'll bring it up to pure white tendency but without actually being at pure black tendency it was damned again it was damn near impossible to get it to pure white and so that was very irritating because it was just very difficult to actually manage to manipulate 
and even then, like, most people wouldn't even know about it just doing an average playthrough. And so, you know, if they do it right, that'd be cool. Like, they showed uh, two side-by-side screenshots, and one's just kind of like, you know, this general kind of knight-looking dude as a boss, and then in the same level, they show it as, like, when you've done whatever causes, you know, some kind of insanity to set in, or whatever, it's this very beastly, uh, scary, gigantic-looking dude. And apparently, from what they... I mean, it could just be that their screenshots are two different uh, occasions, two completely different things, but from what they implied is that it's possible to basically, under normal circumstances, you'll fight this regular night guy, but under bad circumstances, you'll end up fighting this massively different, just bestial-looking, scary guy. Uh, so that's interesting. And then I'm trying to look through this right now, just so, I mean, I obviously I should have uh, probably done this beforehand. And I don't really want to look too long on uh, what all of this is. This is all just like speculation of what people want rather than actual uh, information regarding what was leaked about it. But so anyway, basically, I mean, obviously I'm excited for Dark Souls 3. Miyazaki is rumored to be in control of it, which is fantastic since the entire debacle that was Dark Souls 2 was because Miyazaki was not uh, involved in any way. That said, there's also a lot of people that are quite worried about it because Miyazaki seems to have or in at least in the eyes of a lot of people he seems to be kind of anti PvP and they use Bloodborne as the example there how it's really hard to actually invade in that game because you can't just invade anybody at any time to invade somebody they either need to be in the nightmare worlds nightmare of Menzies or the nightmare frontier or alternatively they need to be ringing their small resonant belt to try and co-op with somebody and if they co if they do succeed with co-oping with somebody then they're possible then it's possible to invade them but then obviously those people are coming in with the advantage they're potentially fighting you 2v1 or 3v1 and so a lot of people about that is kind of, you know it kind of scares it uh, some people that maybe he'll you know not follow the footsteps of Dark Souls 2 which let's be honest Dark Souls 2 made some great strides in accessibility and uh diversity of potential PvP in that game you had numerous covenants that were designed around it you had the battle arena uh, all that various stuff, you know, they made great strides in the availability of PvP, which Bloodborne didn't really follow. So a lot of people are scared about that. Obviously, I don't particularly care, because I've mentioned this before, how the PvP of, um... Um... Sorry, I'm looking at this again. Uh, is more predictive rather than reactionary, and I would prefer it to be the other way around, where it depends more on... I mean, I guess I can see the merits of either way. You know, it's basically read-based versus reaction-based. And it's perfectly fine the way it is. I'm not trying to knock it and say, like, yo, this is the worst thing ever, that there's kind of like a quarter of a second delay to everything, and you need to be predicting where your opponent is rather than reacting to or what he's going to do rather than reacting to where he is right now on your screen and what he's doing on your screen. Uh, I perfectly accept the fact that that's possible, I'm not saying, you know, like, oh, it's impossible to do this because there's delay in it and blah, 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 blah. But my own personal interest in it is kind of very limited in the capacity that's in there right now. Um, but still, I mean, you know, it's Dark Souls 3. I've developed an obvious love for the Dark Souls series, which I didn't really uh, have originally, but I'm very excited for it. We'll see where it takes us. They'll obviously be doing official announcements at E3, and we'll see what of the uh, current leak and speculation stuff is actually true, what's false, probably see more information, hopefully see the game in motion. Honestly, I am mostly looking forward to, you know, there's a certain, obviously people talk about the lack of weapons in Bloodborne is kind of a negative point, but you also have to admit, almost every single weapon in the game is quite unique to itself. Like, there's no real... Uh, similarities like for instance the Kirk Hammer and Ludwig's Holy Blade they're one handed just regular sword form they're pretty similar to each other but obviously their transformed versions are remarkably different the saw cleaver and the saw spear are quite similar by themselves but other than that there's really no similarity between all the different weapon types whereas like sure there's a bunch of different weapons that kind of have different uh, specific like scaling or minute differences in amount of damage delivered some of them obviously have spe certain special attacks that almost nobody actually uses but the majority of weapons like they share move sets with each other so really if you've used one you're kind of using all of them and there's pretty much like a definitive this is the best this type of weapon 
So, on one hand, I can kind of understand, like, you know, you went from having potentially 100 plus weapons to only having, you know, whatever, the 12, 15, however many are in Bloodborne. I understand that criticism, but I also kind of question the validity of it, of, or like, how much of a problem people consider it, given that there's not a lot of uniqueness between the weapons that are in Dark Souls. And, again, how there is just kind of like a definitive best version of it. Like, for instance, you look at my run in Dark Souls, I tried out, I have tried out, well, I've tried out uh, the Great Scythe and the Life Hunt Scythe, and the Great Scythe is by far, it's better than the Life Hunt Scythe, pure and simple. It does more damage, the bleed buildup, it really isn't a factor. You're not dangering yourself, so you don't have to make a specific build. You don't have to use up a ring slot on the blood bite ring. The Great Scythe has better scaling. Better it actually has better damage in the end anyway, once you get it to plus fifteen rather than the life hunt scythe at plus five. Um, pure and simple, like the great the great hunt scythe is just better in every way with the great hunt scythe. The great scythe is better in every way than the life hunt scythe. And that's kind of how it is. It's just there are sure you there are other weapons you can use. But in reality, you can be using a better weapon. And there's really, that's the only kind of difference is the amount of damage these things do. Rather than, you know, having a diverse move set or looking, just even looks, there's not really that much diversity in terms of the weapon. So, like, on one hand, I kind of understand it, but then you also have that argument of quality over quantity, which is a very valid argument to have. But they've already said, I think they said at least 100 plus unique weapons uh, so far, I think. I think, I think, I'm not I'm entirely positive, but I believe 100 plus unique weapons and at least 45 plus new enemies on top of some returning enemies are a thing as well. So, you know, obviously I'm looking forward to it, can't wait to see what they do with it, hopefully it has better level design than Dark Souls 2! I'm currently going through the DLC of Dark, I'm probably actually post, by now, by the time I actually post this, I'll probably have, um, more stuff. I'll probably have posted the Dark Souls 2 videos of me trying to go through the DLC areas, but fuck the DLC areas. I also completely forgot right until now, right until I was about to end this, I did mention in a previous video, in the Guilty Gear video, that I would talk about if I would do another Win Will He Quit series. I don't really need to talk about it, to be perfectly, I kind of answered it. Like, yes, I will, I have been pondering it, I've been thinking about it, like, you know, what could I possibly do as a potential Win Will He Quit series? However, that being said, I need to find a valid, a good game to do it with. And obviously that is important rather than just trying to like, you know, obviously you want to build the game around the system rather than trying to like just shoehorn the game in and make it somehow fit and be interesting. You want the game to be suitable by itself rather than trying to add challenges to it that may or may, that may or may not make it interesting. So anyway... Thank you for listening once more. As always, if you want to hear me talk about anything, please feel free to let me know in the comments that you want me to talk about X. And I will obviously get to it in the next Nate Talk. So, I'll see y'all later.